Well, good morning again. Can I turn this thing on? I did, okay. Um, I wanted to, before I get started this morning, just remind you, I think I mentioned this earlier, uh, a bunch of articles I put in the library. I have to be honest with you, I have put more reading and time and thought into last week and this week's messages than any messages I can probably ever remember. Um, I, didn't, I don't consider myself a politically oriented person, but you can't avoid it uh, in the world we live in today. So I wanted, I know I've been putting some things in the library for you to just check out and read, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, where I'm going with this this morning. But if I had to mention just two, uh, the one I've been mentioning to you is the 10 prayers for a volatile election season. I am so glad to see that's when those were gone. Uh, I put more of those out there for you. And then the other one I would suggest would be 25 precepts for this in every election. Uh, and probably that was one of the more influential ones I'm talking about today. So I wanted to just remind you of those, make sure you're aware of those opportunities out there. Uh, as I said, I've done more reading uh, for today than probably anything. And then as I got down to it, I was telling Gary this morning, I have cut out so much stuff. I just When I have a thought about a message or something, I'll just type it in and it just sits there until I get to a little bit closer to it. And then I just cut I probably deleted more pages about today than anything. Because what I ended up with, I wanted to encourage you with scripture. And just fill it with scripture as we as we meditate, as we think about where we are as a country, who we are as people, as God's children. But I didn't want to start here this morning. From two verses from the book of Proverbs, chapter 29. Can you put those up there for me, Eli? This is from the message, but it says pretty much the same thing in other versions. When good people run things, everyone is glad. But when the ruler is bad, everyone groans. Verse 4 of Proverbs 29. A leader of good judgment gives stability. An exploiting leader leaves a trail of waste. Now, I got a kick out of that because there's, we talk about the Proverbs as Proverbs or principles, but I thought, well, there's a lot of truth in that one. Uh, somebody's always happy and somebody's always upset what they consider a, a good person or a good leader. Uh, and as I said, I've done more reading and thinking about that, but I wanted us to, to at least, I threw those in there to just start there with some scripture this morning to get us into that thought. But, uh, let's go ahead and pray also as we get into this. Father, we come to your word this morning anticipating that you are going to speak to us. Uh, we trust in your spirit uh, that lives within us to guide our thoughts and hearts this morning. Yes. We have lived in a uh, turbulent place. We will acknowledge it before you in the past months and even years. We are a divided country and divided people. Lord, we pray more than ever that today our church would be united. Yes. Would be seen as a people of hope, a people of peace with the story and uh, the hope of redemption to share with the world. Uh, we are thankful that we have um, no reason to fear this morning, but reason to rejoice and have great hope. Yes. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So we find ourselves hopefully near the end of another turbulent election season. And perhaps I just didn't pay attention when I was a kid, uh, but it seems to get more turbulent every time we get into it. It gets more uh, bitter and angry and hateful. Uh, I'm, I've had discussions with several of you outside of this pulpit that are, you know, you kind of understood my political inclinations. Um, but uh, I think one of the things that I've said to some of you so often is I wish we could do better. Uh, just from whatever choices we have, I wish we had a better choice. But anyway, it seems that Americans, at least according to the polls, are nearly evenly split about how this thing is going to go. Um, but if you think about it, this, as I said, this one's been particularly divisive, particularly dramatic, particularly uh, suspenseful. I mean, if you just think about those things that happened just in July, it seemed like so long ago there was an assassination attempt on one of the candidates. Uh, the incumbent president decided he wasn't going to run the vice president with only three months left. I mean, that's those three events alone are enough, and that was just in the month of July this year to make this, this thing pretty suspenseful. You've probably been overwhelmed by this, I know I have, unless you've been in a, you know, a hermit living in a cabin somewhere in the woods with no social media, no TV, radio, or news of any kind, and I know you guys like the news, so uh, you, we've been overwhelmed by this sort of thing. Uh, we've been drowned in this political season for many months now. We've been told through social media and the news for many months the dangers to democracy. We have heard things like, this is the most important election of your lifetime. Well, one of the things in that article I mentioned about the 25 precepts is there's no way for you to know this is the most important election of your lifetime. Until years later, we look back and go, you know what, that was the most important election of my lifetime. 
Have any of you, by the way, decided today what was the most important of your life of your lifetime before? Probably not. You don't care, right? After it's over, it's over. We don't we don't think about it anymore. So to me, that is something that's intended to stir up feelings and motivate voters in what we're trying to do if we're honest about it. We've been told the danger if we do not vote for a certain candidate. We've been told the danger if we vote for the other candidate. There is tremendous fear that this X will happen if, if the person Z is not elected. Right? If you don't vote for candidate A, then candidate B will win and do this. If you don't vote for candidate B, then something bad will happen to you. It's used by both sides. And what does it do? It's stirring up fear. Entire campaigns are based on what will happen if the other side wins. I miss the days where politicians, I did see one, came, one commercial this week that the politician said, this is what I believe, this is what I stand for, and it was so refreshing. Rather than just telling us what's wrong with the other person, they mentioned things like uh, the economy, or democracy, or worldwide wars, or immigration, abortion, jobs, education, taxes, all of those things are in danger, and the worst will happen if you don't vote for candidate A or candidate B. They've given us many reasons to fear the outcome of this election. Politicians seem to think that you will make your decision and vote based out of fear. I fear they are right about many Americans. We have been so politicized and so... Uh, what's the word? Hateful of the other side. Whatever side you're on, they try to stir up this enmity, this strife between the, the opposing sides. This partisan time that we live in has been so constructed that regardless of who wins, half of America will be fearful or angry. So that's why I'm titling today's message, Fear and Power. Those are two key ingredients in this election. I know you've probably thought about this before. Hopefully you've recognized the fear elements that have been campaigning on both sides for months now. I began to think about this issue of fear, and I know from a personal perspective that if we look back at an event that started about four years ago, COVID, if we look back at those times when we responded to something that we didn't have the truth, we didn't know what it was. We didn't know how bad it was. We didn't know how to treat it. We didn't know a lot of things. And a lot of our actions were based on fear. Amen. Weren't they? Yes. Now that was four years ago. In that moment, I remember it. We were just trying to figure out what do we do as a church? What do we do as a people? What do I do as an individual? How do we respond? How do we fight against this thing? How do we preserve lives? How do we preserve the church? How do we preserve our economy? All these questions. And we did all these things out of fear. And I don't want us to be, still be true of us as Christians. I want us to think clearly and hopefully and get a good perspective on this. We weren't sure then about what was truth, and then when we were left to fear, we often made choices based on that. I'm always struck by the paranoia. I have I'm on several neighborhood uh, websites and apps, or whatever you want to call them. And there's always somebody posting, it's supposed to be people like garage sales and things like that. But so often the posts that I see are, watch out, I saw a van going down my street last night. And it's just paranoia. Or watch out, so-and-so person was going down taking pictures. Turns out, if you read the comments, it was a realtor taking appraisals of houses. It's like, but people live in this sense of fear and paranoia. And that is not mentally healthy for us. And it's not spiritually where God wants us to be as his people. We're going to talk about where we're supposed to be. I read another quote that says, Fear sells more than sex does. Nothing elicits allegiance and action across all populations like be afraid. So when you hear the language of fear, you're not hearing love. You are hearing control. So where are we going today? I wanted to, we covered some of this last week. My goal both last week with this, the message lies and truth. And today's message, fear and power, is, I've got four goals for us, and a couple of them we met last week. I want to cause us to, number one, bring it up for me, please, Elijah. First off, to be more clear in our thinking, we talked about the truth last week, we want to understand what that means, and more scriptural in our discernment of truth. Hopefully you're doing a good job at this already, but I want to make sure that this is where we are. That's the first thing. Second thing, I want us to 
be aware of cultural influences and warfare around us. You have been influenced by the media, whether you realize it or not. Maybe you've already realized this morning that you've given way to some of that fear that a certain political opponent or campaign has stirred up. I don't want us to be fearful. We'll talk about that. Thirdly, to not fear any threats or political rhetoric that are used to manipulate us. And finally, this is where we end up this morning, to act more boldly in our Christian faith because we are secure in who the ruler of the universe is, and God's people say. Amen. I can't tell you how excited I am to stand here next week and not have to think about, well, who's the president of the United States? I don't think all the fear and anxiety is going to go down. I think it would just be half of the country instead of both halves right now. But all of these things that we have, these four things on the screen this morning, are in alignment with a verse that I ran across months ago that you've heard it a million times. And I thought, this is exactly what I want to talk about on the Sunday before the election. I believe it's probably the most important text to inform us as you go to the polls this week or don't go to the polls or whatever it may be. In 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul writes to Timothy, he writes this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, fear but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Amen. I just want to leave that up there for a minute or so. And let you soak that in. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. And of love and of a sound mind. We're going to break that verse down this morning. Because the thing that came to my mind was the spirit of fear that seems to be so pervasive in the United States today. And I thought, well, that's good to know. God has not given us a spirit of fear. But what has He given us? Well, the verse continues on, doesn't we'll dig into that. But I wanted you to ask yourself a question how much of this season that we are living in is based on fear? Many people live their lives make their decisions based on what they are afraid will happen. I mentioned COVID four years ago, right? We look back and we just didn't know what to do. God doesn't want His children to live this way. When we go back to Isaiah chapter 8, the former read for us this morning, Isaiah chapter 8, verses 11 through uh, 14, or verse 13. For this is, we read part of this last week. For this is what the Lord said to me with great power. The Lord says this powerfully. To keep me from going away of his people. So that I don't fall into that trap of fear. Do not call everything a conspiracy that these people say is a conspiracy. We've got tons of those, don't we? Finally, the next verse. The, the verse continues. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. This is the part we did not read last week. Because we talked about conspiracies and truth last week. Verse 13. You are to regard only the Lord of armies as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held in awe. He's the reason we worship this morning, not a political party. We've gathered here every week because we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, not because we've come here to vote for somebody or not vote for somebody else or stir up someone. If we want to be stirred up about something, let's be stirred up about the kingdom of God and how awesome and powerful our God is still today. Amen. So let me ask you again this morning, what spirit do you have within you right now? Is it a spirit of fear? Because that's the one that God has given us. Paul just told us that. If you have fear, then it didn't come from God and His Spirit. Amen. And hopefully you recognize that the Greek word in that verse for power, anybody know what that Greek word is? Dunamis? What's that word sound like? The English word dynamite. You guys know that, right? The word dunamis, the Greek word dunamis, is where we get the English word dynamite. The kind of power that God has given us is that dynamite, explosive kind of power. He says, it's not fear, it's dynamite. Christian, when you go out in the world, you are not to be fearful. You are to be a piece of dynamite, ready to explode. Not because of worry and anxiety and fear, because you have the power of God and the spirit of him within you. We can act boldly in the world because we know the one who birthed all of creation and the one who knit humanity's DNA together as the spirit behind us and within us. We don't go out into the world afraid of what might happen. Can you imagine how it makes God feel to see his children living in fear? He says, I conquered the world. Fear not, not what you said. Fear not, I have to overcome the world. Some people would think that just having power would overcome fear. Oh, you know, for my party, I'll just win this election. 
the law be good. No. Whichever side you're voting for, whichever side wins, God is still all powerful. Amen. And it will not change American politics or American culture that much. Why don't you just ask the people that have power, they still live fearfully. Fearful that they're going to lose the next election. Paul says that there's more than just not fear, there's more than just power, there's also what else? Love. Which is one that we are prone to forget. I haven't seen a whole lot of people campaigning on love this, this season. So the counter to fear is power and love. That means that whether we win or lose an election, we demonstrate power and love and a sound mind. You see, we don't act fearfully, but we think clearly. We love fiercely, and we act boldly with power. I've had several messages, it's been a few years ago now, but I know I've shared these websites with you, talking about what people in the media have to gain by causing their audiences to fear. I've also shared with us the reality that if you look at the world from certain perspectives, it is really a better place. Especially when we talk about poverty, and world hunger, and human rights. There's a little clip in my notes that if you read through these notes tomorrow, you'll see, just click on that link and it'll take you to, of all people, Neil deGrasse Tyson telling us how much better the world is. And he also kind of contrasts it with the sense of the idea that we live in a terrible place, it's terrible times, the days are evil. And while that's partially true, it's also not entirely true. We will gather here next Sunday, which I can't wait to be so excited to do that. Even if we don't have a declared winner, I'll be glad this whole thing is over and I won't have to watch any more commercials. We will gather here next Sunday, Lord willing, not election willing, to once again celebrate and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, whether we know who the next president will be or not, and we will still plan and expect to operate out of a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. We get to think about, as I was finishing this message last night and this morning, we have two polar opposites in nearly every way to vote for. It's no wonder our country is split, because that's who we are politically. And regardless of who was elected, I'll say it again, Jesus is king. Amen. Regardless of who wins the election or what happens, God is still the one on the throne. His grace is still sufficient. We are still sinners, and unless he returns, we will gather for worship again a week from now. As I was reading scripture one day, I'm certain it's been during this election season, I ran across a passage of scripture that what I now want to call this morning, Paul's unelectable stump speech. Now, what I want you to imagine is that the Apostle Paul is going to run for some sort of office. And as he gets up onto the, to the, to the stage, gets behind the microphone on the pulpit, these are the words he says from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want this on the screen because I want you to look through this. And imagine Paul campaigning for office with this speech. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom. Have you ever heard a political candidate proclaim that? As I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you. Except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear. And with much trembling. He continues on. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. But with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom. God's people said, Amen. hear what Paul is saying. He's not running for office, is he? Here he continues on. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. He's talking to the Christians. Those who consider themselves followers of Christ, mature in the faith. We speak them to them this message, but not the wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age, who are what? Coming to nothing. In the scope of all eternity, who wins the election this week really means nothing. Other versions translate that passage, uh, who are doomed to pass away, or are soon forgotten. Here's a little exercise for you. Try to remember who, who ran, who lost at the elections in the previous years. It'll take some work, because it's not that easy. Because once somebody loses the election, we just forget it's because it passes away, it's over and forgotten. 
Some of us have a hard time remembering who won. You want to take it hard? Try to remember vice presidents way back in the 70s. I've done that exercise. It's almost impossible. I was a kid then, but taking whenever you were first starting to become involved in those sorts of things. Who was the vice president then? I have a hard time sometimes in the 80s and 90s. Can you imagine a politician getting on the stump saying what Paul says here? says, you're going to forget about me in a few years. That's not what they're doing, right? But that's how Paul presents himself in the gospel of Christ. He says, it's not about me. It's not about my wise words and my persuasive speaking. It's about the spirit and his wisdom and his power. Now hear me this morning. I'm not saying that politics and politicians are completely unimportant today. But there's also Romans chapter 13, which we should add into this discussion. In fact, if you think about it, Joseph and Nehemiah and Saul and David and Daniel are all heavily involved in the leadership of their nations. We have a lot to learn from them. I wanted to preach about all of those guys and their approach to politics, but we clearly don't have time. So I'll start to wrap up this morning with a couple verses. The first one is in James. As we think about how do we respond Christianly and spiritually and biblically, James writes in, verse chapter, in chapter 1, verse 19, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. The other one I wanted to start to wrap us up with is Psalm 37, 37. The word says, Mark the blameless and behold the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. I really struggled with how to conclude this message this morning. So let me start here. I have no illusions or desires that I will change your mind or help you make up your mind about the candidate you have decided to vote for, and that's not my goal. I don't think I've mentioned either candidate's name from this pulpit throughout this entire series, so this has not been my intention to mention either one. Secondly, let me remind you today, as I'm certain I will remind us again next week, you know what next week's title, sermon title is? Hope and Healing. That's what our country is going to need. Regardless of who wins, we still need hope and healing. Let me remind you today, as I'm certain I'll remind you next week, Jesus is king. God is good. All the time. All the time. And he's still on the throne. Regardless of who wins and who loses. He already knows what will happen, who will win and who will lose. The world will still be turning after this election because God spun it and no election can stop it. And God will still have his hand on you. Thirdly, I thought I'd throw this in. We are a missionary church. Every once in a while, they write some good stuff. And maybe you're just a little concerned or you disagree with me about something, which you probably do. We all disagree about politics. I can guarantee you there are people on opposite perspectives politically in this room. And we're a small church. And that's, that's like in a country of 350-some million people. So the missionary church has this... In our, in our Constitution, it's called an attitude towards civil government. And I thought I'd share this with you. Maybe this would be encouraging to some of you. You like it? You thought the screen There we go. We believe, this is the missionary church as a whole, we believe that civil government is ordained of God for the welfare of society. To promote and protect the good and to restrain and punish evil. If that's all that government did, that would be fantastic. Therefore, we consider it the duty of Christians to pray for rulers and for those that are in authority over them and to give due loyalty, respect, and obedience to them. Say it again. Pray for the president, vice president, anybody who's running all those sorts of things. We've been doing it throughout our prayer meetings and it's been in our prayer list for a long time. That section continues. Christians are also encouraged to take an active interest in government at all levels. Where the demands of civil law would militate against the supreme law and will of God, Christians should obey God rather than men. And I think we're going to come to that in the next several years, regardless of who's president. We're going to find out who's going to obey God, who's going to obey men. And there's a whole bunch of references. You can have all this stuff. I'll send you, as I said, I'll send you the notes. I'm 
Fourthly and finally, I would say this this morning. I find it ironic as servants of the sovereign God. Note that when he came to earth with all power and all authority and all wisdom, Philippians chapter 2 says this, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave that was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. And that's the most important thing you need to remember. Our leadership and our loyalty should not be about fear and power. It should be about a suffering servant, a humble healer, a sovereign savior. Our sovereign king used self-sacrifice and humility to assert power over the greatest foe of all, sin and death. He didn't win through fear, he didn't win through power, he won by self-sacrifice. Let's pray to him this morning about what we should do. Father, we are so thankful that there are so many places in your word that we can turn to that remind us of our attitude that we should have as we enter this, this crazy world. We'll admit we've been caught up in the strife and the hatred of it all and the back and forth. God, but again, we pray this morning that your church be unified, that your people be recognize our calling as children and as the kingdom of God. Lord, we pray this morning that you would give us wisdom to choose how we will act in this day and age. And especially in the days ahead. When we anticipate more turmoil, and we, again, pray against the violence. Lord, give us grace if our side loses. Give us love for those who chose otherwise. Lord, give us boldness to act without fear. We, again, pray for the peace of our nation and our people. And we pray against any violence that may be incited or begun. Help us to be people of peace. Remind us of the peace of God that passes all understanding. And those hopeful of God's peace said, Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? I couldn't think of another way for us to end in a more peaceful way than to say, be still my soul. Perhaps you've not been as caught up in this political season, and good for you. But it's been a hard thing to avoid. It has stirred my heart about the tone and the attitude of Americans towards each other. I don't think it's proper for God's people to be part of that. So I want us to, to remind ourselves who we are and whose we are. So we close with this this morning. Be still my soul, the Lord is on the side. Be still, my soul.